But no, I missed you guys. This is, uh, I see familiar faces that have been with us on Wednesday nights for a while. And some of you guys that came in here this fall, which is really exciting. Um, I love Wednesday nights. I love what we're doing. I love how many different Bible studies and things we have going on all over campus. It's, it's exciting uh, to see um, what God's doing on Wednesday nights here at First Baptist. So I'm glad you guys are, are here for this is, just so I'll give you a little background of what we're doing here. Um, this is really the fourth class of a four-part series that, that we started last year um, in the, I guess we started it in the spring of, of last year. So we, and here's, here's kind of what we, here's kind of the track that we've been on so you kind of know how to follow along with what this is. We started with um, eight weeks or so looking at the heart of God in the gospel. So we looked at big ideas like justification, sanctification, glorification. We looked at the what, what is atonement? What does redemption mean? Um, and so we just looked at some of these theological terms that we use a lot in church, but we really just looked at how rich those words are. And But then every week pointing that back to what do these truths, what do these theological truths teach us about the character of God, about the heart of God, uh, just to help us know Him better through through that look. So that was what we did first, and then we kind of did another one, um, lay in foundation. We looked at our identity in Christ to see what what does Scripture say about who we are in in Him, how we find our identity in Him, and we. So that was another um, eight weeks that we spent doing that, and then. Most of you guys know the last eight weeks spent looking at spiritual disciplines, and I hear really, really good stuff from, from that class with Jason and, and with Bubba, just looking at how to study the Word of God, uh, what, what, what God is doing in His Word and how we can see that, and then, and then prayer. Um, so somebody just tell me real quick, because I wasn't in here, um, Biggest takeaways from some of you that were with Jason and Bubba. What well, Jason's not in here yet, so I won't make you, you know, I'll put you on the spot before he comes in. Um, from that study, what are some things that stood out to you? Just give me a, just a couple here. We won't spend much time doing it, but when you were looking at the Word of God, what was something that jumps out or stood out from, it's been a few weeks. Okay. The overall story line. Okay. From beginning to end, how it weaves the thread all the way through. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, God's perfect plan through all that, how it kept coming back to him. Cool. That was pretty good. Good. I appreciated the aids. So, like, he picked the translations and laid them out from all the way from word for word to total concept or truth. Right. Right. Paraphrase. Right. Yeah. Paraphrasing. Um, it gives you a perspective. Yeah. Good. Well, that one was meant to be, and we kind of have been moving, just so you know, from those first two classes, we're very, very heavy theologically, right? We were laying a really good foundation, helping us know some things. These second classes, the spiritual disciplines, and then the one we're going to be doing for the next few weeks are much more, okay, now that we have this understanding Let's get practical. What do we do with this understanding now? So yes, like taking the word of God, let's, you know, let's not, let's let you be able to dig into it and be able to, to do that yourself, right? To see what it's saying, to trace some of those themes and threads through scripture, to see what God is doing um, is good. How about the prayer portion? How did that go? So I was excited for you guys um, to have Bubba do that. <laughs> I'm a little jealous that I didn't get to sit in here. I missed it. So um, may get him to do it again sometime so I can sit in. So <laughs> yeah, what, a, what a treat that is, right, to have him uh, here and, and God using him here. I think that's so cool to see, to see what God's doing there. So good. Um, all right, well, let's pray, and then we're going to jump in because I know you guys, you're going to talk a lot, right? And I'm going to barely get a word in. And so we're just going to run out of time before it's all said and done. So, uh, But let, let me open with a prayer and then we'll get going. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for 
Father, this room uh, full of, of people who are, are hungry to study your word, God, to apply it to their lives. God, would you be our teacher tonight? Uh, through your spirit, God, would you reveal truth to us from your word? Uh, God, would you show us how to apply it to our lives? Uh, God, give us ears to listen, God, but give us a heart that's sensitive and soft and ready to, to obey. Um, thank you for what you're doing in our church. Thank you that we have this opportunity to gather like this in the middle of the week. Uh, so we just give you this time. Pray that you'll use it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so for the next six weeks, we are, we're going to do something that I'm just calling everyday gospel. Um, some of this material uh, is from a book called Gospel Fluency, and it's a book that I gave out when I first got here, not long after I got here, to some of our growth group leaders and, and teachers, but it's, uh, so I will just I have some copies of that book. I need to bring them next week. So if you want to get one of those, I have a few left. But some of this idea comes from, from reading that book. It's just an excellent book that basically just says we as believers, right, we could articulate the gospel many times, right? We can, we can say, like if I were to ask you, define the gospel for me, right? If I just said, what does the word gospel mean? You would say, Good news, right? If I said, now, define the gospel. What is that good news? If you could put that in a statement, what would that statement be? Yeah, Jesus came and died for our sins. We might say it is the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. You know, we would say it's his, it's his life and it's his death and, and resurrection. All those things are correct. That is the gospel. But what I want us to do, and like I said, Last year, we looked at what God's doing in the gospel, what some of those truths about salvation are, and we, we looked at those and just, you know, were just in awe of, of God's love and His grace and His mercy through what He did in the work of the gospel. But here's what I want us to kind of wrestle with this time. So this is going to be some, some time for us to, to talk about some things in here, but I really hope that this is something that throughout the week, you're thinking through some of these things. You're applying some of these things because I think a lot of times as believers, we have a tendency to think about the gospel in terms of, well, that is all about my salvation, right? This decision that I made, this, this prayer that I prayed, right? It's how I go to heaven. That's what the gospel's all about. And we forget that the gospel actually speaks into the every day of our life. Looking at all of our life, our marriages, our friendships, our occupations, uh, other relationships, everything should be filtered through the truths of the gospel. So that's kind of what we're going to wrestle with for, for the next six weeks is how we do that, how we take the gospel and look at our whole life through, through what Christ did on, on the cross for us. So that's the next six weeks. So the first three are going to be more about laying the foundation and talking about what we mean by that. And then the final three weeks are really going to get application heavy about, okay, now what do we do with it as individuals? What do we do with it as a body of believers in a local church, whether that's our growth groups or whether that's in the larger context of our local church? And then what do we do with it in, in the world? What do we do with the gospel outside of these walls and how does that impact our everyday everyday living so that's just to give you some people I know it helps to know where we're going so that's just a little roadmap of where we're going to be for the next for the next six weeks so we're going to start tonight in Galatians so if you got your Bible go ahead and open it up to Galatians chapter 1 If we're going to view life through a gospel lens and, and understand how it impacts the everyday stuff, our circumstances and different things, then we need to start with just right thinking about the gospel. 
And Paul, when he wrote to the Galatians, he was, this is what the whole letter is about. It is Paul addressing a, a group of believers who had received the gospel. They had put their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, but a group had come in preaching a different message. They were called the Judaizers. And they came in and started preaching a different message. And we're going to pick up on that as we, as we kind of go through chapter 1 a little bit. So Paul has to write to the Galatians to say, let's get back to right thinking about the gospel. So that's what I want us to walk through here. So first thing I want us to understand is be able to answer the question, when we think about the gospel, who accomplished our salvation, because that's what we're talking about here. So look at what Paul says. I'm going to read up to verse 3. Paul, an apostle not sent from men nor through human agency, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who were with me to the churches of Galatia. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul starts off with this statement saying, listen, here's what the gospel produces, right? Here's what the gospel gives you. He says, grace to you and peace. This isn't just a greeting. Paul's starting to dig into the benefits of the gospel, what we're recipients of because of what Jesus has done. He says, you have, you have been the recipients of grace, God giving you all this that you didn't deserve, you didn't earn, and, it, and the result of it is it gives you peace with God. We who were enemies of God, Scripture tells us, we who were dead in our sin and trespasses, he says, we now have peace with God. But in that very verse, we see who accomplished the work of the gospel? Who does that verse say? Verse 3. Yeah, God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the very first thing that we have to remember, and you say, well, Daniel, this is kind of, like, why did I even come tonight, right? Because if we're going back to, yeah, I know, God is the one who did the work of the gospel. But I think what we're going to see as we really start to dig into the way we live our everyday lives, is we have a tendency to forget sometimes who it is that is responsible for our salvation, right? Who, or who the gospel originates with, who accomplished the work of our salvation that gave us grace, that gave us peace with God. And so it's important to remember this work began with God, it was completed by God, and it is secure because of him. So he's the one who accomplished it. How did he accomplish it? Let's look on at verse 4. It says, Who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. How did God accomplish the work of the gospel? Yeah, he gave himself, right? And that is, did anybody force Jesus to lay down his life? Absolutely not. It says, verse 4, who gave himself for our sins? We would use a term, he became our substitute. He took our place. He paid the price that our sin deserved. That's how he accomplished it. And what's the term he used? So that he might rescue us. We're going to dig into that in just a little bit because that's really important for this understanding that we're trying to lay here when we think rightly about the gospel. Look on at verse 5 to get a good answer for why. Why did God accomplish for us to save us. Why, why, why the gospel? Why did he save us? Why did Jesus give himself to rescue us for, from our sin? For his glory. For his glory. Right? And that's, that's another important understanding for us to have. I want you to flip over. Hold your place there in Galatians because we're coming back. But flip over to John. Flip over to John chapter 17. Why did God send his son? Why did Jesus come? 
to live the life that we couldn't live, to be our substitute, to pay our debt of sin so that we could be made right with God. Why would he do that? Look at what he says in in chapter 17 of John, right hours before he is going to go to the cross. Verse one, Jesus spoke these things. Raising his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. What's the hour he's talking about? The hour of his death has come. He says, glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. Look on in verse four. I glorified you on the earth by accomplishing the work which you have given me to do. And now you, Father, verse five, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world existed. This is one of those topics that I don't think as as the church we spend enough time just meditating on that truth that the work of the gospel, ultimately, the why behind what God was doing in the gospel was so that he would be glorified. We think of it in terms of what we receive because of it, and we do, right? We are recipients of his love, of his grace, of his mercy. But ultimately, first and foremost, God accomplished the work of the gospel to glorify himself. Yes, sir. And what's so staggering is to just reverse that statement. So God accomplished the work of the gospel to glorify himself, and then reverse it. But the glory of God is in the death, burial, and resurrection of his son. Hmm. The, the, the God who can speak all of the universe into put all that stuff together, wants to glorify himself through the death of his son. And we're going to, as we go along, my hope is that even if you've been a believer for 50 years, that you're going to come away from the next six weeks saying, I never get over the gospel. Like every day that I wake up, there's something new about the gospel that just makes me fall in love (laughs) with God more than I ever have been before, right? It it shows me something about myself that, that I haven't seen before. I mean, I hope that is what we do because that is, I mean, the depths of what we're going to talk about it really is one of those things that our minds could never comprehend what God was, was doing, why he did it. Like even that statement, right? God did it for his glory. Well, we can say those words, but we could spend now until the day he takes us home trying to understand and think through all the ways that what he did glorified himself by pouring out his wrath on his son. I mean, it's just, it's, it's beyond our comprehension, but it's, but it's worth our investment of time to, to do what we're going to do as we think through this and as we apply it. It's good. All right, but here's something I want us to see, and this is why we're doing this class, is because of what our tendency is as, as people. Look at verses six and seven. Look at, Paul gets into why he's writing, okay? Everything else, everything we've talked about so far, it's just the greeting. It's just his introduction to the church, right? He's just, he's letting them know, hey, I'm writing, love you guys, right? Know the whole purpose of this is all about Jesus. It's all about the gospel. It's all about what Christ has done in you. But now I'm getting ready to bring the hammer down because you guys you guys need some correction. And so that's where we're headed. Look at what he says, verse six. I am amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is not just another account, but there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now, If it was a tendency, if it was a temptation, if this was a propensity that these believers had in Galatia, do you think 
that we today could have the same tendency or bent to distort the gospel and the way we live. We do, and I think that's one of the things, this is so convicting for me as I think through this. It's like up here, I intellectually know the gospel. I can tell you that it's not my own righteousness that saves me, that it is nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ that that forgives my sin, right? And it's all God's doing. I bring nothing but my sin to the table and God does all the saving. I can tell you that. But you know, when I think practically about how I live my life, there's a lot of times I don't, it, you would wonder if I don't believe wrong because my behavior doesn't always line up with what I know to be true. And, and in one sense here, these Galatians who Paul had preached the gospel, and if we read the whole first chapter, Paul would tell them, hey, the gospel that I preach to you, it's not watered down. It's not some made up thing that I got from somebody else. I received it directly from the Lord. And so I'm sharing with you the gospel message. These guys, these Judaizers who came in, they came in, and here's basically what they were saying. Yes, faith in Christ is necessary for salvation, but, and anytime there's a but or there's a and in addition to that first statement, you're, you're distorting the gospel because the Judaizers would say, you need to put faith in Christ Oh, but by the way, you need to be a good Jew as well. You've got to practice the law. You've got to go through all, all of the rituals. All of, You have to keep the law just like the Jews, but we're going to tack faith in Jesus onto that because both are necessary for right standing with God. That was the message that was being preached. And some of these in the church of Galatia and the church is in that area They were buying into that. And so they were practicing what is basically a works-based salvation. They were starting to live like Jesus Christ was not sufficient for salvation. It requires something else as well. And so that's what is our tendency as, as human beings, even as believers. It's to distort the gospel, right? We, we are capable of living in a way that doesn't line up with who we are as as a follower of Jesus. And so that's why I'm really praying that God will show us some of those things in his kindness, right? Not not in a way that makes us go out of here feeling, gosh, I'm blowing it, right? I can't believe I did that. No, but in God's kindness, he starts to show us ways in our lives that we're not letting the truth of, of what he did for us just permeate our minds into our hearts and come out in our understanding of who we are, right? And in the way we relate to one another and our speech. I'm hoping that that is what happens because it's for our good. It's for our benefit that, that we do that. So that's my prayer is that we would do that. Look at what he says in verses 13 and 14. Paul starts to give some personal testimony here because here's a dangerous possibility. And this is, this is a scary thing. Um, but look at what he says. He's talking about his life. Verse 13, for you've heard of my former way of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries and among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. What was Paul before before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was a Pharisee, right? Was there anyone in that day and age that knew the scriptures better than the Pharisees? The Old Testament scriptures. Was there anybody that knew what at that time was the word of God, right? They didn't have the New Testament. So the word of God, the Old Testament scriptures, was there anyone outside of the fair that knew it better than the Pharisees and what does Paul say about himself as a Pharisee was he like barely making the cut no he was like a Pharisee of Pharisees he says I was advancing like beyond all of my contemporaries he was top of his class Pharisee right I mean brilliant mind Pharisee zealous 
right? We understand from the book of Acts, we're going to see in the days ahead as we go through the book of Acts, what was Paul doing to the church prior to his conversion? He was persecuted. He was so zealous for what he believed that he was persecuting those who, who were following Jesus. So here's what I want us to think about for just a minute. What is a tendency or a possibility, I guess? What is a dangerous possibility that could exist if we, aren't, if we don't have a right understanding of the gospel and, who, and with a focus on who Jesus is? Is that we can have a lot of knowledge, right? We can know a lot of things, even the scripture. We can know scripture and miss Jesus, I mean, Paul is proof that that is actually possible. Paul knew the Old Testament scriptures. And you guys told me like the last class that we, that we, you just finished, like one of the things that stood out to you uh, from, from going through how to study the Bible was the thread, right? Just seeing those themes and that thread, that narrative in scripture that all points to who? It all points to Jesus. Paul had those. He knew those scriptures. And yet even though he had this knowledge of the Bible, his interpret, he missed Jesus in the middle of it. And Jesus actually has that indictment for the Pharisees. Look, I just want to have you flip back over to John for just a minute, to the words of Jesus himself in in John chapter 5. Look at what he says in verses 39 and 40, talking to the Pharisees. So he's talking to the the Paul, the Saul's of of that day. He says, you examine the scriptures. You study the word of God. You're in Bible studies because you think that in them you have eternal life. Basically, he's saying you think that as you study, as you gain knowledge, you think that that is what is going to give you right standing with God. You examine the scriptures because you think that in those scriptures you have eternal life. And what does he go on to say? And it is those very scriptures that testify about me. Then verse 40, and yet you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? That we can spend time studying the word of God and yet miss the whole point. And that's what I want us to see as we we go through this, that the, the whole point of all of it as we study the word of God, is that we would see Jesus clearer. That we would have a deeper understanding of who he is and the work that he accomplished for us and how that should change everything for us. I mean, Paul's own testimony says, hey, I knew the scriptures. I was zealous for what I thought were the things of God, but I was missing it. So those were his warnings, but look at the beautiful reality of what the gospel does when we're thinking rightly about it and applying it to our lives. Look at the end of chapter one. Look at how he closes it. After he says, here's kind of what I was doing after my conversion. He says, but they only, these people, people were hearing testimony and rumors about Paul. And it says, here's what they were hearing about Paul. The man who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. What is the beautiful reality of the gospel? What was Paul's testimony? What is our testimony? What does the gospel do? Yeah, absolutely. Amen. Yeah, it, it takes us from death to life, right? From lost to found, from unworthy to clothed in his righteousness, right? From aliens and strangers to adopted sons <laughs> with an inheritance in the kingdom of God, right? I mean, it, it transforms our life. And those transformed lives, what does it say? When the testimony came out of this transformation in Paul, who got the glory for it? God got the glory for it, right? Because it takes us all the way back to full circle of where we started the conversation. Who accomplished the work of the gospel? God did, right? He gets the glory for what he does in us 
and then through us. But the whole purpose is transformational living, right? Not just eternal security, but today, transformational living. So that's a foundation. We're going to come back to some of those truths as we go along. But tonight, I really wanted to lay that groundwork so we could see that before we, before we got too deep into this. So a couple of takeaways that I want us to think about that's also going to be something that we circle back to. Two things, two crucial takeaways for us here. See if you can guess, fill in the blanks here, okay? God is intent on making what about Jesus? Anybody want to be brave and take a stab at it? Okay. Everything. God is intent on making everything about Jesus. We don't have time to unpack all the scriptures that I put right down there uh, underneath that, that statement. But just quickly, Romans 10, verse 4. Paul says that Christ is the culmination of the law, which gets back to what we're saying. Everything, even the Old Testament, it all points to Jesus. And he says, listen, God is intent on making everything about Jesus. Even the law itself points to him. It points to our need for him. It points to the fact that we are incapable of pleasing God without someone who could step in and do it for us, that we were incapable of living up to that holy standard, that righteous standard that God requires. Jesus did it. So even the law, it says Christ is the finish line. He's the culmination of that. In Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23 Paul's actually quoting a psalm when, when he's talking here. Let's look at that one. I do want to turn to that. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. It says, And he put all things in subjection under his feet and made him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What did what is it? What was put into subjection under his feet? All things, right? He's head over how many things? He's head over all things, right? This is a quotation, like I said, from Psalm eight, verse six. But it but it causes us to think back. Remember, we talked about how all Scripture is tied together, how there is this thread that points to Jesus all through it. If we go back to Genesis chapter one to the creation mandate where God tells Adam to fill the earth and to subdue it and to have dominion over the earth. He's, put, he's created Adam and Eve in his image and he tasks them with this job of filling the earth with his image, right? To have dominion, to rule and reign over his creation. But by two chapters later, it's all it's all gone to a mess, right? So Paul talks about Jesus being the second Adam. And so when we read in Ephesians chapter one, where it says he's put all things under his feet, he's made him head over all things. It's showing us that what we were incapable of doing, Jesus did, amen? I mean, that, that's, that's the whole point there, but it's all about him. Um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 20. Another great passage, very much has the same feel as what we just read in, in Ephesians. But he says in verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things and in him all things hold together. He's also the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself whether things on earth 
or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. You think God wants us to know something about the work of Jesus, about who he is? Right? And that, this is so crucial for our understanding and our application as we go along that everything points to him. Everything is about what he came to do and what he accomplished for, for us. Second thing, God wants to rescue, right? Pulling that language, save, save would work there too, right? You'd be right to put that word there, but borrowing the language from Galatians 1, 4 that we read just a few minutes ago, right? He gave himself for our sins that he might rescue us from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin. Right? God's intent on that. That's God's plan. Right? And I love in verse 4, don't miss this. He gave himself for our sins that he might rescue us. But then the end of that, the end of that sentence, what does it say? From what? In Galatians 1, 4. This present evil age. So, so salvation has an eternal aspect to it, right? That we are, be, we are saved from the penalty of sin, eternal separation from God, amen? That's part of the gospel. But is there a, is there a present tense reality of the gospel for you and I as believers? Is there something now that it, that it, it has application for in our lives? What does Paul say? He doesn't just rescue you from the ultimate penalty of sin, he says, in this present evil age, what's that about? How, what is he saying here? The gospel speaks into yeah, our daily lives, our daily battles with sin, right? The temptations that we face, right? The struggles that we have. He's saying God's desire is to rescue you from that in your daily life. The gospel speaks into all of that. And that's part, of, that's part of the beauty and the power of the gospel. It's what it's doing in us right now. Amen? And that we talked about that months ago, that we're justified. We are declared right with God, right? But now we're in this process of sanctification, where we're being conformed more and more into the image of God. And I would say that that is happening the deeper our understanding of the gospel becomes sanctification is taking place in our life and we are ultimately looking forward to the gospel having its full work in our lives when we are glorified, right? Some of the things we're looking at in Recharge on, on Wednesday nights, that day when we will spend eternity with him face to face. So he rescues us. Galatians 3.13 says that he redeemed us from the curse. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, you'll have to go back and look at some of these here just for sake of time. But he says in Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, it says, and you were dead in your transgressions or your offenses and sins. Now I think that's really, it's important to understand because all in chapter 1, in Ephesians, Paul has been talking about here is what we have in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Here is all that is ours because of the gospel and because of what Jesus did. He said, and oh, by the way, without that, here's, here's who you were before. It's right. This beautiful picture of in Christ, this is you versus apart from Christ, here's who you are. You're not in Christ, you're in your sin, right? Which means separation and condemnation. From God, but that's not God's intent. It is to rescue us from our sin. Amen? And that's, Jason, I thought about what you said a minute ago. Look on in verse 4 of, of Ephesians chapter 2. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, loved us even when we were dead in our wrongdoing, made us alive together with Christ. It's that in the cross, we see on display at the same time God's wrath and God's love 
in, in that picture of the gospel, right? Just that, that idea of God is glorified in the death of his son, right? And that, that speaks to how God is glorified in the death of his son. By pouring his wrath out on his son, he's showing the depths of his love for, for you and I, that he would pay that price. That, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, that is why he chose to pour his wrath out on his son so that we could be declared righteous, so that we could be saved. Right? At the same time, we see both of those things on display. And in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 5, I love this truth. He took away our sin. Isn't that a great thought? When something's taken away, is it there? I mean, is it there anymore? I mean, sometimes we, do we do that? Do we understand? This is part of those ways we've got to apply it. Here's what I mean by that. Like if I were to ask you as a believer, have you been forgiven in Christ of your sin? Your answer would be, but do you walk around many days carrying guilt and shame because of sin in your life? Maybe past, maybe who you were before you met Christ. Do you walk around sometimes listening to the lie of the enemy that even though you would tell me that, well, yeah, on the authority of Scripture, I know I've been declared righteous. I know that Christ paid for that. But you still walk around paying for it every day, don't you? With, with words like, well, God could never use me because of, because of this. Or I could never do this because of this. Or you don't even like, step out and say, well, yeah, I could be used by God. I could use the gifts and the talents that he's given me because we carry around and we believe this lie about ourselves, right? But passages like that, it's so important for us to understand, hey, in Christ, in the gospel, he took it away, right? There's application there for, for everyday living. So two, those are two crucial takeaways that I want us to know. And just some, a few things here that I want us to walk through. And this, I want to get some, hopefully get some good discussion going here. Just thinking about, for us as believers, right? If you're here on a Wednesday night, right, for a Bible study, um, and you've been doing this now for a while. Most of you guys were in here for the last eight weeks, right? Many of you guys have been here for over the last year doing this faithfully on Wednesday nights. You know, you've got a heart to know him. You've got a desire to live a life that glorifies God. So what are some right practices for a disciple of Christ? I think Paul gives us some really good insight into that through his own testimony right before he is about to go to his death. In 2 Timothy, the last known written words we have from the apostle Paul as he's writing to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, he's speaking to him and he says, hey, for this reason, I want to remind you to kindle afresh or fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. Right, and then he goes on, God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power and love and discipline. He says, so don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, right? Don't be ashamed of the gospel or be ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join me. Join me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, right? That's not a, something, you know, man, it sounds great, but I want to suffer for the gospel. He says, hey, join me in this. The gospel is so beautiful. The gospel is so precious. Paul says that it's worth suffering for if necessary. And he says, because God saved us and the one who called us with a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and his own grace that he granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Sounds familiar to a lot of the things we've been reading tonight, right? He says, but now it's been revealed by the appearing of our Savior. He abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, which I have been appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher for this reason. 
I've suffered these things. This is what I want us to see. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to protect what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul knew his death was imminent. He knew it could happen at any moment. He knew before he even finished writing to Timothy, a soldier could come and get him, and that could be it for him. So even in his final days, maybe, what's the first thing on his mind? It's the gospel. It's what Jesus did. And he says, it's still precious to me, right? Even now that I know it is going to cost me my life, there's still nothing more precious to me than what Christ did for me. So as a disciple of Christ, it's important that we know the gospel, but not just intellectually know. Paul says, hey, I know who I have believed. The next word, he says, I am convinced, right? I don't just know it, I believe it. I believe what it says. I believe what it means for my life. So we've got to know it, we've got to believe it, and we've got to be able to speak it, right, into our own lives, but also to others. We've got to be able to speak the truth of the gospel into our everyday lives. That's Paul's admonition to Timothy, is, hey, listen, if there's one thing I can leave you with, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Know it, believe it, and speak it. And then, I, and then he even says, hey, and the things you've heard from me, teach them to other people, right? So that's something that for us, my prayer through this is that as we begin to apply the gospel to our everyday lives, it's something that we begin to disciple others to know it and believe it and speak it, right? Disciples who make disciples all rooted in gospel-centered conversation, what, that's his desire. That's the right practice of a disciple. So how's that going to happen, right? And that's kind of what the rest of this course is going to be about. All this has kind of been introduction tonight. But how is it going to happen? The book that I was telling you guys about called Gospel Fluency gets to this very point, right? If all the things we talk about are really true that we've already covered tonight, what, how do we get there? And this is that idea, we've got to be fluent in the gospel. To see it, like when we talk about fluency, what's the first thing we think of? We, we think of a what? A language, right? Being fluent in, in a language, right? Anybody in here bilingual? Hmm. <laughs> Barely speak English, okay. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> All right. So, so we're going to think, and that's kind of the press that I want us to have, is as we talk about the gospel, as we start to think about it in these terms, the goal for this course, if I could say, hey, there's a goal for the next six weeks, weeks is that you would become more fluent in the gospel. Is that a good goal? It's a good prayer, right? As, as you're reading your Bible, as we're in here together, God, help me to be more fluent in the gospel. Why do we need to be fluent in the gospel? Give me, we got a, we got a couple more minutes. I can't keep you too late. Uh, I get in trouble. But um, why do we need to be fluent in the gospel? It helps to solidify our own foundation so that we're not swayed by any temptation that comes along. Okay, so being fluent in the gospel helps us self-correct in our own lives, right? Amen. Very good, and that's... You may, have, you, may have, you may have cheated there, Kenny. You may have looked at that first Peter uh, chapter, <laughs> chapter 3, verse 15. Verse, anybody know off the top of your head what that verse says? Other than Pastor Jason? <laughs> what does it say, Jason? <laughs> it says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have inside. Amen. Now, can we do that with just cliche statements? Like little, little churchy statements? Like, ah, uh, just pray about it. Or uh, Jesus will meet your need, right? I mean, is that, is that how, is that being fluent in the gospel? Is that always being prepared to give an answer for the hope that's within you? Is that what we mean? Is kind of being gospel-ish, having gospel-ish statements? 
that we can throw at things that sound really churchy and really spiritual? Is that what Peter's talking about? It's not very relational. Yeah. It's not, is it? Always be that word. And sometimes we be prepared. Right? And that's kind of what, I, that's what we're doing over these next few weeks. We are preparing to be able to give an answer for the hope that's within us. But an answer that we can, because we know it, right? We know the answer. I mean, we could boil the answer down to one word. It's who? It's a person. It's Jesus, right? But let me ask you this. If you're talking to a neighbor, if you're talking to a lost family member, right? Is that answer just to say, you know, hey, that, that struggle in your life that I know you're dealing with because you're far from God and because your heart has not been transformed by the gospel, are they necessarily right away going to hear when you, when you say to them, well, you just need Jesus, right? Jesus could fix that, right? Are they going to hear that every time? No, you've got to have, you've got to be seasoned. You've got to prepare. You've got to be fluent in the gospel to be able to speak that truth that, yes, they need Jesus, but speak it in a way that where they are, they can hear it. Because you have to spend time thinking about what, that, what your relationship to God means to you. Absolutely. If you never think about that, it's like, you know, you're caught off guard. But if it's who you are and, and you know what God means to you in your life and what he's done for you, it's easier to share your experience. You become a witness to what you've experienced. Yeah. Yeah, to be able to put into words all the ways that the gospel has transformed our lives. All right? The gospel, tell me some things. What is it? What does the gospel give us? It gives us hope. Gives us hope. Yeah, yeah. So be before we chase this rabbit, because it's really good, like what we're saying, when when Peter here says, uh, be ready to give a response for the hope that you have. Well, what we've seen as we've come through the scripture tonight, that our hope is the gospel, right? It's this fullness, this richness that we've been talking about. That my sins have been removed, that God is glorified in the death and resurrection of his son, like all of that. So the hope is the gospel. So what we're saying is, is don't just give a trite answer. I mean, maybe you can at times. We're like, oh, we'll just pray about it, right? But... But ultimately, the hope that we have is this richness, and that's why we need to become fluent in it, right? So that we, we don't just say, well, pray about it, or I'll pray about it. Uh, like, well, yeah, that may be a fine conversation starter, but when you come back the next time, it's like, how do we, how do we present the gospel? How do we talk the gospel? And that's, that's where we're going. Yeah, that's, that's exactly where and we're going. the verse going. Uh, implies that you're going to be asked. Yeah. Because you're displaying a hope that is unknown to them. So if you're fluent, like you've been saying, if you think about what God means to you, if you think about the gospel, like, like Jason was saying, and you're living it in your life, people will see. You'll, you have something they don't. Be prepared to explain this hope that is so different from everything else. Amen. And that, that's kind of how we're, that's why I said this is going to get really practical as we go along, right? I, wanna, I don't want to rush too much because I really do want us to take time, like even the next two weeks, like understanding the gospel as fully as we can in a short period of time so that we can do that very thing of then applying it to the everyday like Dan said, the situations of our life, right? Sometimes we need to preach the gospel to ourselves, right? Because we live wrong, right? We can get, I'll give you an example. I, I, marriage is on my mind because I just finished doing a wedding. And, uh, and oh, what a, uh, what, a, what a journey that one was. Um, so, you just move into a new house. and I, sure marriage is on my mind from, yeah, the, <laughs> the list of, uh, yeah, marriage is on my mind. But does the gospel speak into our marriages? Yeah, it should, right? It absolutely should. You know, what? what? Not every day. Not every day. <laughs> but you know, one of the one of the most difficult things about marriage, right, is is when we get confronted with our own selfishness, right? I'm worried about my needs being met, 
right? And so I'm putting up walls and I'm, and I'm looking to someone to meet my needs, right? Selfishness creeps in, right? And then resentment builds up and right, strife can happen. How does the gospel speak into that? Let's just do one here in like a minute, all right? How could we apply the gospel in that very instance with marriage, in, in this understanding, confronting our selfishness? Okay, amen. Anything else? Oh, just that, for God so loved the world that he gave, right? This idea that, that it is, that our focus, like if we have, if we're recipients of the gospel, we should have that same heart that Jesus did to give, not just be about receiving. How about this? Do we have everything we need in the person and work of Jesus Christ? Are all of our needs met through the work of the gospel? So who should we be looking to for worth and identity and fulfillment? Is it our spouse? No, we have that in who? Right, and so does that free us up then to be able to love someone else sacrificially and reflect the character of God to our spouse when we know the truth of the gospel tells us that we he is sufficient. He is everything we need. We don't have to look to another human being to give us our worth or value or security. It's all found ultimately in him. Right? That's a game changer for marriage when you understand the gospel speaks into marriage. Right? That's just one little example, but that's what we're talking about. Being so fluent in our understanding of what the gospel does that we are able to then speak it into those everyday situations. So, it's good stuff. Um, how does it happen? Right? Three things that I want us to be thinking about. Well, hold on. So, okay. So are you saying when we're at work and our uh, coworkers come up with a marriage problem that we might just give them the advice? You know, marriage doesn't work unless you have Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> marriage is infinitely harder without Jesus. <laughs> right? Um, how do we know when we're becoming more fluent, right? How does it happen? How do we know when, when that's actually happening? When, can, when we're evaluating, looking at our lives, right? Well, I think language, all right? I'm by no means bilingual. Um, you know, I took a lot of Spanish in high school and college. Don't think I retained any of it, really, outside of being able to count and, you know, knowing a few phrases. But when I worked for Chick-fil-A, uh, years and years ago, um, we hired some Hispanic people and that's, they, they knew no English. And so the only way to communicate with them uh, was, was Spanish. And you know, and I just started to notice after three months of listening to them talk to each other in the back of the store as they were cooking or making salads or whatever they were doing, like what at first was like so fast that I'm like, I don't even know if you're making anything more than just sounds. Like I don't even think, I don't even know those, I don't remember any of those words. Like I don't hear anything that I was taught. The speed started to, in my mind anyway, in my ear, it was slowing down. Like I could start to make out words, right? Within a few more months, I'm like, I understand that conversation. Right, they would speak to me and they would go slow and they would help me, you know, like we would get out a dictionary and they would show me like what word they were trying to say and, and I get it. You know, and I actually, after about a year of working with them and having to learn to communicate, I found, I found myself actually thinking in Spanish. Rather than, rather than having to think it in English and then translate it to Spanish, like when I knew I needed to tell them something, I actually thought about what I needed to tell them in Spanish. Like there were times I would start to talk and it would come out in Spanish when I was talking to someone who knew no Spanish. That, that you know, now I haven't, but you know, I left Chick-fil-A and have been gone now for a lot of years. Could I do that now? 
Absolutely not. It'd be like starting over again. Why? Because I don't practice the language. That's why this is going to be so valuable. As we practice the gospel, as we practice speaking it, it just becomes something that it's just natural. We start to think in terms of the gospel. We start to, we start to just process through that lens. How does the gospel speak into that situation? Right? How do, I, how do I work the gospel into this conversation, whether it's with a non-believer or with a believer? Right? How do I, that, that's what we're talking about here is gospel fluency happens when we immerse ourselves in a culture, in a language, right? So those, we interpret all of life through that language. We start to think gospel. We start to feel things <laughs> as, you know, based on what the gospel says, and we start to speak it, right, in our everyday conversation. And then something we were getting at a little bit ago, it happens as we embrace just becoming more like Christ, that own transformational work that he wants to do in us, the gospel becomes more, um, we become more fluent in it. So that's the goal, right? If I had to say, what's the goal for this study? It's those last three things on page five that we would start to do those things. That's, that's my prayer for myself. That's my prayer for each of us, that that would be what we do. So the next two weeks, we're just going to kind of walk through this, the, the four movements of the story of the gospel and just really understand them. And then we're going to start the fun part of just starting to apply them and how we do that personally, corporately as a body of believers, and then with, with the world around us. So that's where we're going uh, to get you started, a couple of exercises. If you like homework, there's a couple of pages there with application questions on page six and seven. I would definitely encourage you. The first one is take time. To think of a time in your life where you experienced a situation that pulled you away from right belief in God. Right? Think of a time where you weren't looking, evaluating something in your life according to who you are in Christ. And then, so think about that. Take some time to really process that. Where were you? What was going on? How did you respond? You know, if you were thinking wrongly. And then think about how if you applied what you know to be true about the gospel to that situation. If you could go back and apply that, how would that situation be different? Just spend some time thinking about that with something that's already happened. I think that would be very helpful then starting to think through, now how do I apply that to stuff that's yet to happen or that's happening right now? And then, so that's a personal one, right? That's a personal reflection. Then I want to whet your appetite a little bit for something coming up in a few weeks. Think through collectively, right? As a church, right? As, as, as part of the body of Christ within our growth groups and, and life groups and, and circles, our Bible studies that we're in, what could this do? if we understand the gospel better? What barriers could it overcome, right, as we talk about Jesus and speak the truth of the gospel to each other? What could that look like, right? Just what, what could that produce in us as we become more fluent in the gospel? So I think that would just be good, just some good exercise, just starting to get our minds immersed in this, thinking about this, and then we'll get started with it some more next week, all right? Sound good? All right. Well, I look forward to being with you guys for the next several weeks. Thank you very much.